the last week of uh, February, things have been wonky, or <laughs> whatever word, right, you want to use. Um, the first two and a half weeks of March, um, you know, Scott mentioned pipeline. Those of us who run businesses, we live and die by pipelines. And unlike Scott, I'm a one woman show. Um, the pipeline that I have in place is perhaps a little bit smaller than other bigger companies. And the first two and a half weeks or so in March, Bob, um, it was pretty horrible to the point where there were a couple of times where my husband said, here's a paper bag, hyperventilate, and then come back and be a ninja because that's what you need to do. And I think, you know, Scott said it so beautifully. By the way, Scott, it is a delight to meet you. We connected recently on LinkedIn. Your story is so inspirational. And, you know, frankly, it speaks to what I think the, the entrepreneurial mindset and vibe typically is in that, you know, when things become the craziest, we become even more ninja-like. Um, I've always said, you know, way before the pandemic, the bigger the disruption, the huger the opportunities that come out of that disruption. And absolutely, Bob, I am seeing that all over again. Um, the first couple of weeks, I had that dip where people, most people, some people said, oh my gosh, Faizun, I have no idea which way is up anymore. I cannot do this. And they went off. The majority of my clients, however, they said, you know, things are really uncertain. This is something, starting a franchise is something I want to do, but can I take a little bit of a break and see which way the economy goes, how things turn out before I, before I continue moving forward? Most people are in that category. But here's the interesting thing that happened about the third week of March. So, and this is, this is my perception. You guys jump in and tell me if you've seen it differently. I think the first three, two, three weeks in March, it was sort of that, you know, when somebody hits you, it's a full punch in the face, you do not see it coming and you get knocked off your feet and you're laying on the ground and you're kind of half blacked out and you don't know what the heck is going on. I think collectively, that was where we all were as a world, as a nation. People were like, oh my God, what the hell just happened, right? You turned on any news channels, that is all you saw. Interestingly, and you, know, you mentioned social media, I live on social media because with a grand marketing budget of zero, that's how I do my marketing, right? And so it's interesting the, how, how the, the collective emotion, if you will, on social media has shifted over the last couple of months where it was all doom and gloom. We were all going to hell in a handbasket and even worse. And then the third week of March heading into the last week of March, guys, it just went bonkers. I am busier now than I was pre-COVID. My pipeline is bursting at the seams of people who are saying, I think this is my time. And I think, Bob, you know, what fundamentally happened, um, it's interesting, I was reading an article this morning uh, she said it so beautifully. She uses this analogy of, remember the lost and found boxes in schools, right? The kid loses a, loses a mitten, loses a hat, whatever, right? Lost and found. And she gives this analogy of how as human beings, as professionals, as parents, as fill in the blank, whatever, we are taking a really long and hard look at this lost and found box. And, we are, and many people are saying, I lost my job. I have gotten laid off. Where is my source of income? The, at the very same, same time, many of these people who are now clients, many of these people are saying, hmm, instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Can I change the narrative in my head and say, why is this happening for me? And just in doing that simple switch, it opens up it opens up the, the options and possibilities that they, that they perhaps didn't think they had before. I think what fundamentally happened is all of us, we were stuck at home. We, had, we didn't have to jump up in the morning, get in our car, go to work, do the same thing at the end of the day. We were not in these endless, endless calls or you know, going to the lunchroom or the boss is coming in or you're going over to a colleague. All of that came to an abrupt halt. Sure, many people were still Zooming and you know, all that stuff happened, 
But I think fundamentally, the world paused. And many people who are thoughtful about their lives and their careers, they too took a pause and said, is this really the path that I want to be on? You know, I've done X for the last 27 years with, I'll use my prior company, with Verizon. And, you know, I was in marketing for Verizon for 27 years. Is this really the life path I want to be on? I missed seeing my kids grow up. You know, my spouse and I, we don't really have the best relationship because I was never there. Um, I've made money, but there's still gas in the tank. I'm not ready to retire. What else can I do? I may have thought about a business in the past before, but for whatever reason, never really went all the way forward. Perhaps this is the time when I'm at home. I have all of these resources around me. I've always said, when if I ever have the time, I will do blah, blah, blah. Well, what else do you have now but time on your hands? Um, and I think essentially that's what happened for a lot of people, at least uh, the folks that I have had coming to me over the last now, I guess, two, two and a half months. Interesting. Uh, are you getting new uh, people approaching you now that you didn't know before March 15th? 100. How, how are they hearing about you? So it's, it's interesting. And Scott, I'm going to keep picking on you, my friend. Um, even in the darkest, most horrible, most down point in his business, he could have curled up in a fetal position and said, F it, I'm done. This business is toast. I'm done. Let me just get out of here. He didn't. For whatever reason, he didn't and he hung on. That two to three week period where I, you know, I didn't literally happen, but figuratively, my husband handed me the brown paper bag and said, hyperventilate, get back on your horse. This is not the way we do things. And so it's that. Even in, these, in this really horrible situation where all you heard was gloom and doom, my marketing shifted, Bob. So it wasn't necessarily, hey, Scott, do you want to buy a franchise? I mean, that is completely absurd. People are losing jobs. People are getting sick. People are dying. The, and I think this, this says a lot about kind of veering into the world of marketing. But I think in these types of times, it's not the selling. You need people to know that you know what they're going through. Many of these folks I know personally. I've interacted with many others, complete strangers, found me predominantly through LinkedIn, where they followed me, they saw the kind of messaging, they saw the kind of interactions, where it wasn't selling, it was more, what are you guys doing? Hang in there. There are opportunities. I know everything looks horrible right now. We will get out of this, right? That sort of messaging where you are, it's more continuing to build the relationships versus selling on relationships, if that makes sense. I think that is really what has helped me kind of um, recover, if you will, if that's the word, recover as fast as I have. Because I never stopped what I was doing, even when things were really horrible. Kept the pace going, but did it just a little bit differently with some pivots. I don't know if HT shared this with you, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here. Uh, this is probably now April. His franchisor, uh, who started Mahana Pokey, which is now Mahana Fresh. Um, Dave is a good friend of mine. And he pinged me and he said, Faizun, um, HT is having some issues with his funding. Yeah. Because of what's happening right now and because of the fact that it's a food franchise, I mean, who the hell's going out to go eat in a restaurant? And so the bank is potentially thinking they're going to yank his funding. What can you do? I was like, oh boy, okay, this is a new one. So I reached out to the funder who I know quite well. Um, he's been in the industry for forever and a day. He runs the largest franchise funding organization in the country. And I said, look, you know, gave him the details on HT. And I said, listen, this is, I don't know what you can do, but can you do something? Long story short, I, and I don't know, I, I didn't want to delve too deeply into that. But the point is, I mean, for me, it just, the way it played out was pretty incredible. The, one of the biggest reasons, Bob, that someone decides to start a franchise business versus start a business from scratch is if you go with a robust brand, there should be ideally certain things that your franchisor helps you with. You know, there's this phrase in franchising, we use it all the time, where we say, you're in business for yourself, 
but you are never in business by yourself in a franchise. You have, think of yourself, think of me as a sole practitioner, but I'm not really alone because I have the strength of my brand behind me. This is what Mahana did. This is what Dave did. He stepped in and said, hold on, he's my franchisee. What do I need to do to make sure you haven't lost the shirt on your back before you've even begun? The other, other key thing, Bob, that I want to say, and I haven't talked to Dave recently, so I don't know. What we found in the industry, and I can give you so many examples, particularly in food, particularly in QSR, what we call quick serve restaurants, which is what Mahana is, these brands have fully pivoted to online ordering and delivery. We don't need you to come in and sit in our stores, do all of that stuff, order and then come pick up. Many of my brands have seen record months in April and in May than in their entire history since conception. Pretty astounding thing, right? But these are the, these are the kinds of things I am seeing happen in real life with real life human beings, people who are clients who are now friends running these different businesses. Yeah. Amanda, I know how to question. Sorry. Go ahead. Did somebody else have a question? Amanda? Well, I was uh, going to ask, uh, I think you've somewhat answered this, but how are franchises in general doing through this crisis? And is it affecting them? It's certainly affecting individually owned businesses in large numbers, but uh, tell me about uh, how it's affecting the franchises. That's a great question, Amanda. I had a feeling you would ask me that. Um, Overall, generally, I think there are certain brands have slowed down. I'll give you an example. McDonald's, the biggest hit that they took in late February, March, heading into April was what they call their breakfast category. Why? Think of it this way. Who are predominantly the people who go pick up breakfast items? Commuters. I'm on my way to the office. I stop, I get a coffee, I get a whatever I get, and then I go off to work that entire population vanished. People were working from homes or gotten laid off or what have you. They very quickly pivoted. They took all the items off of their breakfast menu and they focused on essentially lunch and dinner. This was the thinking. People are locked up at home. Parents and kids are locked up at home. Parents are losing their freaking minds wondering what the heck to do with their kids because schools are closed. On top of everything, I now have to do lunch and dinner kill me, shoot me in the head now, right? And they're saying, I need to go out, go order out for lunch or dinner. Combined, these two categories combined, many franchisees made more money than they ever had when they began began with McDonald's. Papa John's had their best month in April in their entire, I forget, 27 year history. Uh, That's just food. I'll give you one example and I'll end there. Fitness, right? The one category or the the, the business that many people think is going to be the first one to die. Because here, you know, people are not going in to go work out, to go do their yoga, whatever they do. What is happening to these businesses? I work with, um, they're a holding company that runs eight of the most well-known fitness brands in the country. And, you know, it's strength, it's weight training, it's yoga, it's Pilates, it's rowing. They're all across the board. Here's what they did. They took stock of the situation. They said, all right, in order for us to preserve as many of our members as we can, so people don't leave and say, hey, I'm done with my membership. In order to preserve that, within a, within the, a span of about a week and a half, two weeks, they fully moved to an online model. They offered all of their classes live stream on Facebook to their existing membership. Now, it didn't mean that memberships didn't drop. They did drop, there was a little drop, but not to the extent that it otherwise might have been. Um, They were able to retain a lot of the membership base just with this one strategy. They did a number of other things. Now they're in the reopening phase. Between all of the brands, they probably have about five to 6,000 locations across all their brands. Uh, more than half of those locations, half of those locations are open now. And they have very stringent reopening guidelines. So I think, again, the point is, with a franchise, you are not having to come up with all of your systems and procedures and policies on how do I operate in this new world that we are living in. There's a lot of support you get from your mothership. Are you seeing new franchises being formed that are coming out on the market from scratch? Have you seen any signs of that? 
in the past, uh, funny you asked me that, because I was actually going to say this to Scott privately later on. <laughs> uh, seriously, no, for real. Um, in the last 10 to 12 days, Bob, I have had probably seven or eight people reach out to me. So one of the things for others on the call who may not know this, in addition to working with people who want to start a franchise, buy a franchise, I work with business owners who have a business right now. For whatever reason, they're saying, you know, moving forward, in order for me to grow my brand, I think turning my business into a national franchise brand is the way to go. You know, Scott said something towards the end of his presentation where he said, look, if I can get through June, I am bulletproof. I think I'm totally putting words in your mouth, Scott. I think you said something like that. But the point is, many of these businesses, Bob, they're saying, oh my gosh, I have run ABC business now for however many years. This was one of the worst times we have ever had in our business. I have been able to come out the other end and I'm still standing. And as they have taken stock, they're saying, I think I have something real here. I think I have something substantial here. How can I grow this? You know, one of the things Scott pointed out, he said, look, you know, the, uh, the hours that he put in when the pandemic began, it's unsustainable. This is something that I find with a lot of people I speak to who are saying, I have brought the business to the stage. In order for me to continue the growth trajectory that it is on, I have to be able to put in what I have thus far, and that is simply not possible. So again, franchising, you bring in franchisees who come in and grow your footprint nationally. To answer your question in a very long way, yes, heck yes. Many people are saying this is the best time for me to turn my business into a franchise.